so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about uh, client expectations, uh, how we solve those as developers, and best practices that we've learned along the way uh, with uh, developing AAA projects. Uh, if you're in the audience, hopefully you're uh, maybe co-developing a project now or you're considering it in the future. Or you might be somebody in the studio who is, is being referenced for potential future engagements and you're considering what you're getting yourself into. Um, if you just generally want some insight into kind of Western development expectations, uh, or if you're considering in the future a production or a lead role on a project and again, want to have some understanding of, uh, of how you can help. So a little bit about the company, um, Spearsoft. Um, founded in 2004, it's a US held company, uh, but actually most of our people are in St. Petersburg, Russia, including myself. Uh, we're really happy to announce that we just opened or are opening within the next couple of weeks a new studio in Krakow. Um, and so if you haven't already, please stop by and get a beer ticket uh, from our booth in the main hall and, and help us celebrate. We're really happy to, to be here. Uh, some of the titles that we've worked on in the past, um, some of the franchises, Dragon Age, FIFA, Sims, uh, and some of our client listings that we've worked with uh, currently and, and in the past. Uh, a little bit about me, so I started off um, in computer science, and out of university I went into biotech uh, for a couple of years before I had the bright idea that maybe Biotech is not that fun, and, uh, and blood is not that fun, maybe, except for fake blood. So I went into video games, um, and although the irony, I guess, is I mostly worked on shooter games after that. So I went to, uh, to EA, um, to Sony Studios, and most recently, I was at Epic Games working on Gears of War. Uh, so again, starting off as an engineer, uh, mostly in back-end services, I worked on uh, you know, Need for Speed, FIFA franchises. Um, and then I was a, either a lead producer or the director of production um, on Gears of War, SOCOM MAG, and a PSP uh, Vita title, um, Unit 13. So when you're thinking about kind of success in co-development, AAA co-development, I think there's kind of three key ingredients. The first, of course, is the team. <laughs> so this is you guys. Uh, the second is the relationship be between you and the client. And the third one is actually all of the best practices and the execution to get it done. So when we're thinking about the team uh, and assembling a team, the first thing that we're always doing is looking within the studio. Um, and so this is promotion from within when we're, when we're assembling teams. So it's, it's really critical that you have a pulse on all of your team, all of your teams, and all of your resources to have an understanding of you know now that you've uh, you've got these people at the studio and they're your most valuable resource. What can we do to make sure that everybody's you know happy and working on on titles that they want to be working on? So probably the most critical thing that we do is uh, is the way that we work our performance reviews um, and the way that we have HR and team lead integrations. So we try to make sure that. Uh, for every person in the studio, we have a good understanding of um, kind of like what their motivations are, what their challenges are, um, and then also kind of like what, what would the client impacts be if we were to move people around. And this is what gives us an ability to kind of look ahead into the future and say, okay, um, you know, we've worked on the last kind of like six FIFA franchises, and as you guys know, these serialized titles, even though they're big, exciting titles to work on, people always want new challenges and to stay motivated. So for us to have a pulse on what, you know, where, what they want to work on next is like, is really critical for us. Um, but you can't always promote everybody from within or move everybody around. So our next most critical component is our recruiting team. Um, and so when we're looking outside of the studio to bring additional full-time people on, we're really looking for a number of, of criteria. The first one, of course, is, is the social fit. This is critical um, because you not only want to work with the people, but you want to have a, a beer with the people when you're done at the end of the day. Uh, technical fit, of course, technical competencies. Um, and then conditionally, everybody, so Spearsoft is an English um, reading and writing studio, so it's, and most of our clients are Western. So it's really cr critical that everybody has good English skills and even understands English subtleties and things like this. Um, for some of our clients, we additionally have a layer where 
after we've identified somebody who's a great social and technical competency fit, we'll actually introduce them to the client and, and get, have the client have an, uh, an a, a, a opportunity to interview them as well, which really gives them, it gives that, that kind of like, in, in reinforces that relationship between the client um, and the developer. So when you're doing co-development, again, it reinforces this idea that, that you're part of a remote, you know, part of a remote team. And then occasionally we'll relocate people. I mean, we have studios around the world, um, but you can't always find people in the local market. So if you know, we'll, we'll look and we'll we'll relocate people and, and help people out to get them uh, into one of our studios. So now that we've assembled a team, we've looked from within and we've promoted, and we've also recruited. Um, how do we actually keep those people? These these kind of like AAA people. Well, we talked earlier about PPRs and project rotation, I, I think this is kind of far and away the most critical one um, for making sure that the people that you have are always challenged and excited about what they're working on. And I think we believe, you know, kind of philosophically that, that idea that uh, you're not gonna have people build excellent games if they're not excited about the title that they're working on, right? So it's, this, is, this is a really critical component to make sure that everybody's working on stuff that they're excited about. Um, we also do kind of I would say measured project selection. This means that you know if you saw the the portfolio, and, and you know probably not every um, developer has this luxury, but um, it, it's one of those really nice things where we look at titles and we you know we make sure that the stuff that we're working on is stuff that or the stuff that the projects that we select are actually also titles that people internally are passionate about. Um, and so you know measuring the project selection, understanding what the people internally are interested in working on is is a big. Uh, a big key to retention. One other thing that we do is um, we kind of, we give people a lot of latitude, right? So we, uh, I think it's pretty important that kind of from a management philosophy, if you hire, if you hire strong people and people that can work independently and, and give them the latitude and the leash to succeed, um, this is something I think that we go out of our way to make sure that that the leads and the project managers and, and even the individual contributors, they, they have an understanding, they have an expectation of what their responsibilities are, and then we say, go succeed, go, go do your job, like we'll, we'll, we'll keep tabs on you, but we want you to feel empowered and that you, you, know, you kind of own your own destiny. And then finally, of course, is out of office activities. So uh, this is the typical, you know, let's go, let's go out on a Friday and let's go have a beer and let's make sure everybody's refreshed. So, that's kind of how we build and retain teams. Um, now when we're actually talking about the client and the relationship with the client, I think our philosophy is kind of um, to make their life easier and I call this to be invisibly awesome. And so this is the idea that if we're part of a remote development team, as long as everything is, and you're working on a AAA title, as long as everything is going perfectly, then, then you just have this healthy kind of like communication and collaboration and there's no, there's, there's no kind of friction, right? Everybody's you know charging towards sprints and delivering things successfully. And so this is this is the this is the philosophy. This is the goal is to kind of be, you know, help them succeed, help them look good when they're, you know, when we're when we're delivering sprints and delivering milestones and and it's being you know pushed in front of the executive board. If we're hitting things and the, and the game is looking great and we're invisibly awesome, then that's that's a success. So, as part of the remote extension of a larger dev team how do we handle this uh, relationship, or how can you best handle this relationship? Uh, the big key here, I would say, is, is sharing is caring. Um, and so this means that uh, if you really wanna be kind of a, a, a remote extension of a larger development team, it's really critical that you're adopting all of the same tools and methodologies um, as, as the primary dev team is. And so this means project management tools, bug tracking tools, source repository. Everything is completely opaque to the client. It just, it feels like they're just part of a larger remote dev team. Uh, even roles and responsibilities and things like the production mechanics, the, these are all things that we'll mimic as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this next, but um, also of course because we're we have studios across the world, um, and but we have Western clients. Um, time adjustments are really critical, and so one of the things that we will do here is we'll make sure that it will stagger our our work hours so that we come in later um, and leave a little bit later, which gives a window of of opportunity of overlap for the Western clients to come into the studio, 
and see that the build is working and be able to ask or answer questions while our guys are still in the office. So we don't, you know, we avoid the idea of like the fire and forget where it's like, oh, I'm going home and I've checked everything in and the build might be broken, but I've already gone home by the time the, the, the other dev teams come in. Like that's, that's a total fail, right? So it's important that you're, that you're overlapping there. And then travel, which I'll talk more about. So an example of how we share tools and methodologies. Um, so we might, if, if they're using Handsoft, we'll be in Handsoft, we'll be in DevTrack, and we'll have a mirror of the, of the Perforce uh, repository. Similarly with the methodologies, we'll be using Scrum. We might even um, adopt a proprietary practice, uh, something like what EA uses, which is called What Good Looks Like. Um, and this is kind of their, their Bible for understanding so that everybody has the same um, vocabulary about about the quality bar for checking things in and the level of excellence, and so we're all speaking the same language. So we'll take a, a document like that or their, their development approach, and we'll actually train all of our teams on this and we'll evangelize this internally. And sometimes we even keep these ideas permanently, but if they have a very specific uh, team development approach or philosophy, we'll make sure that our team understands and embraces that as well. And similarly, another good example from somebody like EA is, you know, some studios have a producer who does everything, who's a development director, they do, you know, tasks and burn downs and capacities and all those things, uh, and the producer will be the quality bar guy, um, or, and, or he might combine those things. So in, in the EA case, they split them out with, uh, they have a, you know, kind of a, a project manager type role, and they have a producer role, and so we'll mimic those as well, and make sure that those those roles and responsibilities are mimicked on both sides. So additional little things in addition to the, um, the kind of big sharing is caring thing. So uh, travel back and forth is critical. Sending your leads uh, and individual contributors so that you're continually, you know, having a good understanding of best practices and pipelines and just spending face time with each other is really critical throughout the project. Uh, we talked about time adjustments earlier. And then there's kind of the mutual awareness of different holidays in different countries and cultural awarenesses that need to happen, uh, bi-directionally, of course. So let's talk about the, um, the chronology of, of an actual client engagement for us. So what happens from the time that we engage to the, <laughs> to the time that we party? Uh, so at the beginning, the, the things that are critical when we're first engaging with a client is we're having discussions about the durations of the project, the, their key dates, if they already know that they're gonna be going to an E3 or if they know that they're gonna be, you know, have to hit an alpha or hit the street at a certain date, we wanna make sure we understand these dates as well because they have, you know, implications for our deliveries. Um, also, their, their scope, you know, what are we signing up for? How big is the scope? Um, what are their, any of their key requirements? Like, does, do they need engine refactoring, anything like this? But trying to do full diligence on what the client is expecting from us. Uh, and then mutual desires, I would say this is, this is a little bit more qualitative. This is, um, hey, the guys on their side are really tired of working on front-end logic or something. Hey, the guys on our side are really interested in working in front-end logic or working on a certain multiplayer component or something like that. And so mutually, um, within this huge kind of distributed co-development team, let's make sure, let, let, let's mutually try to do what we can do to make sure uh, the teams on both sides are working on interesting components and, and pieces that are, that are really meaty. <clears throat> um, so after we've gone through this initial diligence and this client engagement, this is where we start building our actual team in, in a way that I talked about earlier where there's some promotion from within and there's some recruiting. So, Typically, I think the approach that works for us is that we identify this, this core team first, the leads. Um, and so we seed the team with guys that are, you know, that are veteran guys or understand the project, especially if there's something proprietary in the, in the engine or in the pipeline. <clears throat> and then, so we'll seed the core team and then we'll, we'll look to rotate um, based, as I talked about earlier, on like the, their motivations, their challenges, what they want to do in their career. Uh, and then we'll assess the recruiting impact and say, okay, well, we... We seeded the team with five core guys, and we rotated in 10 more guys, and now we know that we need to hire 10 or 12 guys, so you know, uh, what's the recruiting impact for us? When, you know, can, can we hit the dates that we're committing to to make sure that we can ramp up in time and make sure that this aligns with 
with the client. So it starts with the core team, and then we, we seed, and then we, we rotate in, and then we kind of you know, fill the rest with recruiting. One thing that we also do um, that I didn't mention on here is, is internship programs, and Craig might talk about this later when he talks about art stuff, but uh, we also reach out to local universities and try to kind of get local talent that's coming out of the universities to, to seed them into a project cycle and then so that we can you know, have future uh, full-time employment opportunities for those folks in, in future projects. So we're engaged with the client, the team is built. Uh, now we're getting ready uh, to really get into action here. So the first thing uh, that we'll typically do is start a boot camp. And so this means uh, that we'll take a group of people either you know, from, the, from the client to us or from us to the client in co-development, and we'll send these, this kind of core team, these core leads, uh, one direction or the other, and this is purely <clears throat> to get a good understanding of all of their pipelines, all their best practices, and then we'll bring that back and spread that throughout the team so that everybody has the same understanding. This is also a really great time when you're sending this initial team to, I call it bonding, but really this means like we're going out, uh, we're working hard during the day, but we're also going out at night and drinking beer and like breaking down barriers and making sure that, you know, we're setting up a relationship for success in the future, not only technically, but, but socially as well. Uh, and then as I mentioned, the, the last part of that is, okay, now you return back to home base, you're documenting, you're educating the team, you're holding training sessions and making sure that everybody is getting ready basically to, to jump into production. So we jump into production and we start actually building and delivering stuff. And the big key to success here is transparency. So this means that, um, that there's never a disconnect between either of the development teams and co-development. Um, you know, one of the questions I often ask, especially like my PMs when I'm interviewing them is, it's kind of a trick question, but I'll ask, um, you know, how when, when you sense that there's a, like you're, you're, you're not going to hit your, your sprint or, you know, there's a disconnect and you're getting off track, how do you explain this to the client and what kind of messaging do you give or how do you, how do you reach out? And the, really the answer here should be, well, there, there really should never be a delta, right? Because we're, we're, we're giving them daily reports and, you know, from every individual and they have an understanding of what everybody's working on yesterday and today and what our burn down looks like. And so there's, there's never this period of hibernation where you're silent and then you, you miraculously merge and say, you know, we're, we're 100 hours ahead or 50 hours behind or 100 hours behind. Like, there, there has to be transparency and visibility every day if, if you want to succeed, especially if there's, you know, multiple teams in, in co-development. So we have this idea of dailies, which I just described, weeklies, which is kind of a wrap-up and more of a high-level aggregation that could be viewed at more of an executive producer level who doesn't want to see what everybody's working on every day or maybe doesn't care if you're four hours ahead or behind. He wants to see, get the, the higher level picture. Um, and then we also make sure that there's transparency uh, in the sprint planning. So when we're setting up the sprint that there's, you know, the producer is giving the vision, everybody ha hears the same message, there's a universal understanding of what we're going to signing up for, what we're going to try to deliver, what our capacity is. Um, and then at the end of the sprint, so we're, we're all aligned at the beginning, and at the end of the sprint, we all get together um, and both locally and remotely and then and shared and say, okay, well, what went well? What, didn't, what can we improve on next time? Um, you know, the auto builder didn't work that well. We had some broken builds. Like, let's see how we can improve. And these things are, these things are again, the key is none of these things are done in isolation. These things are all done in conjunction with, the, with uh, multiple development teams. So uh, we're trucking through production. Everything's rocking because we're awesome. And, but there's always, uh, there's always things that come up that you can't predict. So um, demos, uh, scope change in the middle of the project, sick leave, uh, hopefully it's not extended. I, I didn't even really want to put crunch on here, but I felt like it's an obligation. Uh, it would be an oversight if I didn't. So really what this means is there's stuff you can't predict. Um, and there's even with the best of planning, there's going to be things that are outside of your control. And so having the flexibility and kind of a positive attitude and helping find solutions uh, for when these things happen is the key here because they're going to happen. And even with the best planning, there's probably not that much you can do to avoid it. So 
Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's fatalist, but I would say you have to have some, you know, set the team up in advance for, hey, there's going to be some curveballs and let's, let's work together to, you know, to build a great project still. Uh, at the end, when we're wrapping up, um, and again, you know, there's, if you look at big AAA projects, a lot of times you'll see this, this real roller coaster of, of churn and retention after a, after a big project ships and because people are, are burnt out or they've worked on the same project, maybe serialized for many years in a row. So, you know, our, our key, because we, we put a lot of effort into hiring these people and retaining them, you know, what do we need to do to make sure that at the end of the project that people are, are ready to be engaged again for the next, the next project? Uh, well, first, we, we celebrate the, the idea that we, we hit everything and hit it on time. Um, and then we, you know, we really encourage people to um, get refreshed, so spend time with their family or spend time in the summer, or take a vacation, do, it, do what you need to do, but that, that freshness cycle. And then open up the discussion with performance reviews and, and things like this where, okay, what's interesting to you? What, what are your motivations? What are your challenges? What do you want to work on next? And have that conversation with everybody and then land the next project and spin everybody up again on something fresh and new um, and, and start over again with the same kind of energy. So that's kind of the, from engagement to, to wrap up, those are kind of, I feel like, the, uh, the keys to success. So having walked you through that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Craig, who's our, uh, our senior art director, and he's going to kind of show you, maybe talk a little bit more in depth, but talk specifically about art, show you maybe some of the deliveries, give you context, uh, show you a demo reel, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thanks, Alan. So I'm Craig Rundles. I'm the Senior Director of Service Delivery for Art. And uh, in, a, in a sense, that really means that I'm managing all of the components of the art department and how we interface with clients. So um, Alan touched on a lot of really good points in uh, the, the in the talk here. So I'll just touch on a couple of things that uh, might be particular to what we deal with in the art department. You know, we, we, we have uh, a lot of different components. We have like more or less three different components in our department, uh, animation, um, 2D art and 3D art, and all of these are, are managed uh, uh, with the client in, in very similar ways that, that Alan was mentioning uh, in terms of just engagement and whatnot. So, but a little bit about me, to just so you know, my background, I started in the game industry about 20 years ago or so, so uh, I joined Sparasoft about seven months ago, and I'm based out of St. Petersburg. Um, so we have about 70-plus uh, artists right now, I believe, is what we're, our count is in the art department, and uh, all of what, what we do, with all this that Alan has mentioned culminates into um, what I would like to say is is a pretty fantastic work I'm very proud of and I know that we're very proud of the work that we've done and I wanted to show some of that today. So we've got some slides to demonstrate some of the art that we've done and uh, I'm going to go through a few of those right now and we can talk about them. So these just a few uh, 3D models that we've done in the art department. Um, I think a couple of these were for Dragon Age. Um, here's some more uh, Dragon Age art. Um, a lot of the, we have some very high end sculptors um, doing some fantastic ZBrush work. And these are examples of high res models that get baked down into maps and whatnot. But again, the, the attention to detail, as you can see, is pretty nice here. Uh, we work for um, a lot of really cool projects, and again, this is Dragon Age. Here's some art from Mass Effect. I don't know if I'll go into any more detail on that. Again, here's some more art from Mass Effect. And uh, some art from our 2D department. Some of this is personal artwork that our guys do on their own time to kind of elevate their skills. Um, this image down here in the corner is an example of uh, some work that we've done for Riot Games. Um, we've done a lot of splash art for them 
and during our engagement. Did I miss one? So this is a lot of, uh, I think, exploratory work. This is, again, going back to what our artists do. We encourage all of our artists to uh, work on their skills, and we've got uh, different programs for that. We encourage uh, them to, to go through tutorials. We uh, bring speakers in to the uh, art department on various different topics. Um, uh, later this year, we have you know somebody coming in to do a, um, a 2D, uh, it's like a 2D seminar for two days. But we try to, we try to engage our artists in, a, in an environment where they can um, build their skill sets. So these are examples of images that some of our artists have done on their own time. And last but not least, I want to demonstrate uh, what our animation team has done. A lot of this work was done for Dragon Age. So as you can see, it's beautiful work. I'm very proud of my department uh, and what they've been able to achieve. Um, so I want to touch on, on one thing that Alan was talking about earlier in terms of retention and things that we do. Um, we care a lot about our people, and certainly in the art department, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, try to help them build their skill sets. But in addition to that, during the recruiting process, we often find that we have people that are very close to people that we might want to hire they, they have a skill set that's very close to what we're looking for, but they're just not quite at the level that we want to bring them on. And we have started a program um, at Sparasoft where we uh, earmark resumes and, and uh, these demos from people, and we call them back in. And we've, what we've done is we've generated a program that we call a boot camp program in the art department. And we've done this across uh, several disciplines. And what we do is we earmark these guys and we um, invite them in to the studio and we run them through a program where they get hands-on uh, training with some of our uh, senior guys in the studio. So uh, the net result is that after, say, four to six weeks of this, uh, they're at a level that we can at least bring them on uh, as a full-time employee. So. We found a lot of success in this, and it's something that we want to do more of in the future. And it, it's, it's part of how, I guess it's another component to what we do in terms of uh, bringing on people uh, and then trying to retain people. It's just a motivation. Uh, it's, it's exciting to see how people can come on board and grow. So, but generally speaking, it's been very successful. So I just wanted to mention that as a component of what we do at the company. So. Um, moving on, so if there's any questions, um, I think right now we're ready to field any questions that you might have about the demonstration. So, so the animations, uh, m most of what you saw 
in that reel were, were keyframe. Uh, and uh, with regards to, like, say, the horse and that kind of stuff, most of that will get video reference just as a, as a target, and we'll look at key poses from that and then keyframe it pretty much. So the majority of what you saw was keyframe. Uh, that we do have projects that we uh, are involved with that are motion capture, where they'll deliver us motion capture, and then we'll go on top of that with motion builder and. We, well, usually our clients provide the motion capture, the source, and we edit the motion capture, and then we'll pull it into something like uh, motion builder, and then keyframe on top of that if we need any you know, more dramatic poses and things like that. Any other questions? Well, if there's, if there's no questions, then I'll just say that uh, Sparasoft, we're very excited to be here in Poland, and we're looking forward to uh, being a part of the development community here. And uh, if you haven't already, please visit the booth, grab some free beer tickets, and celebrate with us, because we are just absolutely excited about this opportunity, so to be here. Thank you.